EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985 or send an email to openline at EWTN.com. A tremendous Monday to each and every one of you. Thanks so much for tuning in to EWTN's Open Line. If you'd like to be part of the program, the number is 833-288-EWTN. That's 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd still love to talk with you. That number is 1-205-271-2985. And we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at 1-205-271-2985. And um, if you are uh, would like to send us an email, we would happy be happy to take that correspondence as well. The email address is openline at EWTN.com. I'm Jack Williams, Charles Beery producing the program today. Your call screener is Matt Gubensky and Jeff Burson handling our social media efforts. So if you're watching us on YouTube or Facebook Live, you can type a question into the chat window and it may find its way to us by the end of the program. And our host is he is every Monday, Father John Trujillo. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Glad to hear it. Getting ready for the uh, the big Chris. Have we, have we sent the seminarians home yet? They're all gone. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, a, there, ship is, the ship is empty. There is a little, little too much glee in your voice there, Father. <laughs> well, the captain's up above in his quarters, and I'm down here in the galley. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Um, as we get started on this edition of Open Line Monday, Hannah writes in, What is Advent? I'm a Protestant and would like to know more about it. Okay. Well, Advent comes from the Latin word ad venire, which is actually two words, ad meaning toward and uh, venire, to, to go or come. And so ad venire means the arrival, the coming. And so for four weeks, liturgically, the church celebrates in preparation for the coming of Christ. We celebrate his second coming that will be uh, in the future. We celebrate his historical uh, coming and arrival, which was 2,000 years ago. And we also meditate on the fact that he he comes to us he arrives every day at mass in the holy eucharist when the priest changes the bread and wine into his body and blood so advent is similar to lent which is a preparation for easter it's not as um strict and um the penances or the penitential season i should say is not as strong uh for good reason so we don't have um obligatory uh, fast and abstinence as we would do during the time of Lent. But Advent is a spiritual time of preparation. Now, that doesn't mean that at home you're not allowed to put up decorations until after uh, December 24th. doesn't mean you can't have Christmas music playing. doesn't mean you can't go to parties. It means in church, however, the decorations have to wait until the uh, celebration of the the Christmas uh, Eve Mass. So, you, you know, you talk about not having to wait until December 24th. <laughs> we had a, a priest in the parish where I entered the church, gosh, more decades ago than I care to think about now. Uh, but uh, Father Sam Palmer of Happy Memory, uh, who was uh, at the end of his uh, tenure, not only is his tenure as an active <laughs> priest, but as it turns out, he was diagnosed tragically with Lou Gehrig's disease and, Ooh, my. and p- passed away after about a three-year battle with that. But... One thing that would just make Father Sam crazy <laughs> was having Jesus in a crash scene before Christmas. <laughs> where where do you come down on the Jesus in the crash before Christmas, Father? Well, I am a bit of a traditionalist that I like to have Jesus not in the crib, um, you know, whether it's at home or especially in church. Now, in the Italian tradition. Um, we have this wonderful custom at midnight mass, little Jesu Bambino, little baby Jesus, slides on a little string or wire from the choir loft in total darkness with a, with a light just shining on him. And, and they sing, Tu scendi della stella, you come from the heavens, the stars. And he slides into the um, nativity set there in front of the altar. You don't see that too much <laughs> as we used to in the old days, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, I. it's not an absolute thing. I wouldn't discourage yeah. <laughs> people from putting them in there. But it's nice to put everybody else. Now, m- 
my mother being Polish, the three kings, you had to hide them until Epiphany. They, they weren't allowed to be on the scene at all. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, it will not surprise you at all that Father Sam Palmer, when his, when his family arrived at Ellis Island, was Palmieri. So, aha. 833-288-EWTN. Two lines open for you at 833-288-3986. Jimmy says, in Revelation, there's a mention of the numbers 666 as the sign of the beast. It is also in 1 Kings referencing the number of talents that Solomon received each year. Is there any special meaning in this? Uh, well, I, I know that within the book of Revelation or the Apocalypse, as it's sometimes called, the number 666 has a number of interpretations, and uh, the church has not, you know, finalized or fallen on one over another. Uh, certainly, in the Hebrew language, the letters have um, numeric value, and so too in other languages. I know you could construct a way to say that the Emperor Nero came out to 666, or uh, some people even tried to say that it, it, equivalent with Hitler. Um, you know, this idea that it's a special tattoo on the back of the scalp, that's something from the movie <laughs> The Omen. It's not biblically based, but I know there's some Christians today who literally think the Antichrist is going to have three sixes uh, scored on the back of his head. Uh, it, it's a symbolic thing. And remember, the number six is considered inferior because a seven uh, days... Uh, of of creation with God resting on the on the seventh, um, seven is considered a perfect number. Six is one less, so sometimes the number six 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 refers to the devil or anything demonic. Um, but you know, as it, it does it ascribe to a particular person in history? Obviously, you know, it, it it could not have because if those people were the antichrist, it would have been the end of the world. So I wouldn't get nervous about people trying to convolute any. A sign, aha, this, you know, because I know Martin Luther tried that and, and uh, said that I was the Pope at the time. Um, the Catholics were saying the same thing about him, so I wouldn't worry about it. And in the Old Testament, um, I don't think there's anything peculiar about the, the, the significance with, with King Solomon. Um, I'm going to go to Craig on the line. We usually take emails in the first segment, but Craig's been holding on since the last okay. program very patiently. Craig in <laughs> Covington, Kentucky, listening on Sacred Heart Radio. You are on with Father John Tregilio. Thank you for taking my call. I was watching some sports over the weekend, and there was a team that I'd never heard of, and I Googled them, and sure enough, they were Catholic. But it just kind of led me to think, you know, I, the Big East, um, different teams, like if if – if my kids and I would choose to uh, root for teams, like which one, which university seem to be following the Catholic faith <laughs> that we can kind of pull for and not, you know, they're not Catholic in name only. Well, that's an excellent question. <laughs> and unfortunately, of the ones um, you see on TV, <laughs> it's going to be slim pickings. I'm afraid <laughs> that's it because the, the really solid Catholic colleges who are Orthodox in their doctrine uh, are either not big enough or they don't have enough money or uh, they don't pull in uh, the big talent, you know, as you would at another place. So uh, obviously, you know, like uh, Belmont Abbey or, um, you know, um, Ave Maria Thomas Aquinas, football. Ave Maria. Um, there's Action, so many that uh, are solid. Steubenville. Um, they don't have a football or basketball team. Or if they do, it, they're not the Big Ten. And unfortunately, the Catholic um, – schools that are in that um, particular club, uh, they're not as Catholic. They may be good at sports, and, you know, I know a lot of priests who are, you know, diehard Notre Dame fans, not to the college or university, but to the football team, right. the, the basketball team. I, watching those games, supporting a particular team, my only caution is if you're going to wear a jersey of those particular schools and it's not very clear that you're supporting the team, but it looks like you're supporting the college or the university, there's where you could get into some problem because it might be misinterpreted that you favor all the things that that school does. Um, so I really can't tell you offhand of any particular – I don't even think there is a one uh, of, of the Big Ten. Uh, uh, yeah, a in a, you know, a Catholic school in big time, Division One college athletics, I don't think you'll find any of them on the Newman list of authentically Catholic colleges. Yeah, that, and that's um, – maybe that's a good thing too because, you know – the schools who uh, have these great teams, 
sometimes they put more emphasis on that than on the orthodox teaching. You know, and I, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, and I'll tell you, and I've heard this from other institutions as well, but, you know, my daughter attended uh, a Catholic university that is firmly on the Newman list of authentically Catholic colleges. And even at that institution, uh, we got a long lecture from the dean of students about how you'll find everything on this campus that you'll find on any other college campus around America. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's Open Line Monday with Father John Tregilio. Tis the season for Christmas programming. Join EWT on Radio Christmas Eve and Christmas Day for the 48 Hours of Christmas with Mother Angelica. You ever notice everybody says around the middle of dinner, oh, I'll never eat again. Then they go for the pie. <laughs> oh, I'll never eat again. Oh, I'll never eat again. And there they are, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and they're still eating and they'll never eat again. The 48 Hours of Christmas, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day on EWT and Radio. Hi, I'm Greg Willits from RosaryArmy.com. And I'm Jennifer Willits, his wife. In today's world, there's an urgent need for all of us to join together in prayer. We can pray for our families and friends, our church, and for peace in our world. In Rosarium Virginis Mariae, Pope John Paul II first directed his appeal to pray the rosary to those who lead the church. He said, through your own personal experience of the beauty of the rosary, may you come to promote it with conviction. The rosary has been a source of strength strength for Christians in troubled times for centuries. John Paul II said, I look to all of you, brothers and sisters of every state of life, to you Christian families, to you the sick and elderly, and to you young people, confidently take up the rosary once again. Find out more about the rosary at rosaryarmy.com. And you can listen to our shows, Adventures in Imperfect Living, Catechism Class, and more at rosaryarmy.com and wherever you find your favorite podcast. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. If you have a question, call 1-833-288-EWTN. That's 1-833-288-3986. Outside North America, call 1-205-271-2985. Or send us an email to openline at EWTN.com. You know, EWTN offers the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass from Our Lady of the Angels Chapel live every morning at 8 Eastern Time, right after the Sunrise Morning Show. Don't miss out. We can send a link straight to your email inbox every day. Simply visit EWTN.com and click on subscribe. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. A couple of open lines for you at 833-288-3986. James is in the Republic of Texas listening on Guadalupe Radio today. James, you are on with Father Trujillo. Hello, Father. Um, I attend a church nearby. It's not my parish. And uh, I've noticed that the priest, when he's celebrating, looked, it looked kind of odd the first time I saw it. and looked like he was at, uh, getting ready to go to the confessional. Well, since then, I've I've been to his masses several times. He's a... He's helping out at the parish. He's not. He's not on the parish staff. He's he's a retired priest, so he's helping out. Um, but I've noticed um, he's not wearing a chasuble. And you know, after, I didn't even know what a chasuble was <laughs> when I first saw it. Uh, but I just noticed something was odd. So you know, I've done some research and found out that he's supposed to be wearing a chasuble. Mm-hmm. If he says mass, and, and this has been going on for I've been going there over a year, I'd say. Mm. So uh, I've heard through the grapevine that he's, his excuse is that he's too short and the chasubles that they have um, at the church don't fit him. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know what to make of it. Uh, does it render the Mass invalid if he continues to say a Mass in this manner? Yeah, absolutely not. It would not invalidate the Mass, and it's not. it wouldn't even make it illicit, but he's doing wrong and not wearing the proper vestments. Now, I do have a little compassion for the idea that the vestments may not fit because here at the seminary we have we have sometimes for the big events, a, sol- a solemnity, they have these uh, special very heavy, very long 
vestments. Uh, they're holy rude. They're very well made, but they're um, not only expensive, but they they're too long. <laughs> I mean, I'm general height. I'm five nine, and I have to bunch them up in my arms like this. And it could be dangerous at the at the altar if you have too much material flying around. Uh, and you're trying to move the chalice without uh, spilling anything. So I can understand that. However, you know, you can always get an inexpensive but well-fitting chasuble. Uh, there's so many places you can get them at. Even up at the EW10 when I was in Hansville with Father Briganti last week when we were taping some shows, we their gift shop, they have some very nice vestments there, I think from Granda, that, you know, they aren't going to break the bank. So maybe if a few parishioners chipped in, the guy, get him something that fits, but he should not just wear an alba and a stole. Um, you know, the, the chasuble is the proper vestment that the priest who's celebrating. Now, if you're con celebrating and you're not the main celebrant, you can wear a chasuble or you can wear the alb with just the stole. But if you're the principal or only celebrant, you should wear the chasuble. So uh, I think he's, um, you know, stretching that uh, excuse there a little bit. And how, how would John or any other parishioner in that situation, how would they approach the, the situation? I would say to Father, you know, Father, um, you know, we'd be willing to help out if, you know, uh, we hear that, you know, there's that you need some vestments that, that would be more fitting to you and making an offer. And if he really, if that's the real reason, he'll say thank you. And if he says, no, I don't, I really, I, I don't want to, you know, then then you might have to go over his head and report it to some, to maybe to the diocese. But I give at least the opportunity and chance to see how we, how we respond to that. God bless you, James. Thanks so much for the phone call. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number, 833-288-3986. Next up is Michael in Jacksonville, Florida, watching us on YouTube today. Michael, you are on with Father John. Hi, Father John. Just a quick two-part question. If a person knows he is in a state where he needs to abstain from communion, one, when he attends Mass, is he still considered part of the sacrifice of the Mass? And two, is it okay for a person in that state to say an act of spiritual communion? Yes, I, on both counts. Uh, if someone's in the state of mortal sin and they cannot uh, go to communion because they need to go to confession, it's still good that they go to church, especially if it's a Sunday or a holy day of obligation. And they can make a spiritual communion. The only thing is they won't get any spiritual benefit from it until... They go to confession, and then retroactively they would receive whatever graces they would have received uh, at that time. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Just a couple of lines open for you and plenty of time for your calls at 833-288-3986. Christian is a first-time caller. He is in San Antonio, Texas, listening on the Guadalupe Radio app. Christian, you're on with Father Trujillo. Hey, Father Trujillo. Um, good, good afternoon. Uh, I, my, my question was, um, what's the uh, what's the response to this uh, Yanuka guy they're you know talking about over there in Israel? Apparently, they're calling him the Messiah, and well, you know, I did, you know, it's like, what's the response to that? You know, I don't want to say that this guy is the Antichrist, you know, but yeah. How should we respond to that? Yeah, I, I mean, this is the first I heard of it, but it's not the first time other people have claimed to be a Messiah. And we can't always conclude that this person has ulterior motives. Uh, they may have some mental issues. They may be completely confused, or they may be a complete fake. I mean, that's certainly a possibility. But there's only one Messiah, and that's Jesus Christ. And as Christians, you know, that's the essence of our religion that he is the Messiah, that he died and he rose and he ascended into heaven and he left us the church and the sacraments. So these other um, you know, people who purport to be or people who claim that these others were messiahs uh, were absolutely uh, were wrong. I know, um, you know there's people who impersonate and then there's people who are confused as. But uh, you know, I don't know what this guy's motivations are. I, this is the first time I heard about this particular individual um, you know, the church is certainly not going to come out with a, a, a condemnation unless, you know, this per particular person comes out and says, you know, everything before me was, was fake or false, then they're going to have to defend themselves. But if there's somebody who's, who's a little out there on balance mentally and is, because you, you go to any place, a psychiatric ward, 
there's always somebody there who thinks they're Jesus. There's somebody who thinks they're Santa Claus. Somebody who thinks they're King Louis the the Sixteenth. Some you know Torquemada, whoever. Um, there are people who are confused, and then there's those r- genuine you know people who are dishonest and are just playing on people's um, you know curiosity. Thank you so much. We appreciate that call today, Christian, there in San Antonio. 833-288-3986. Pick up the phone and give us a call with your question for Father John Tregilio. 833-288-3986. You know, Father John, we get um, a lot of similar questions as we go along on these open line programs. We have a lot of different listeners that are checking in and out. And I always find it a treat when I see one that I haven't really seen addressed before. And I think John has one of those in Greenville, South Carolina, listening on Sirius XM Channel 130. John, you are on with Father John Tregilio. Hi, Father John. How are you today? Fine. Good. Um, I I had a question. I was watching The Little Drummer Boy, the the cartoon with um, my grandchildren the other day. And I, a question came up to my, myself that I, I've always had, and I just never thought of asking anybody. And now I've got an expert. I'm, I'm hoping <laughs> that you can provide an answer. Okay. <laughs> so the, the three kings show up to the, they follow the star, and they show up to the birth of Jesus. And it, it was that important that three kings, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, they present to, you know, Jesus and Mary and Joseph. But why was there not the attention to Jesus after, after the birth? Why? And, and the, the three kings went home, and I, I understand they had different things they had to do, but why was there not the importance of Jesus' stress after, after they left, after his birth? Okay, you mean imp- importance to them? Well, importance to the world, because... I, I, a lot of people recognize that this was the Christ child and, you know, how important it was. There were three kings that showed up from different yeah. parts of the world to, to recognize him. But after they left and after the birth and after they went back to, after Mary, Joseph, and, and Jesus went home, there wasn't the attention paid to Jesus that I would have thought there would have been. Yeah. He was recognized as a Christ child. Was there a reason for that or... Well, uh, yes, um, f- certainly there's the practical reason that they didn't stay uh, in Bethlehem because they they, uh, they they had to flee because Herod wanted to um, kill the child, wanted to kill Jesus. So they had to flee from Bethlehem. They had to hide in Egypt. Then they came back, and they didn't go back to their town where Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Then they settled uh, in Nazareth. Um, back then, <laughs> it's not like today where you have social media and people have instant access and you have all kinds of information that's available. Um, you know, the very fact that they had to register uh, for the birth and the, 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 the census of Caesar Augustus means that, you know, some documentation, very, very minimal. So there was nobody looking for a paper trail. And, you know, Jesus, we call those the hidden years, those 30 years that he was growing up with Mary and Joseph, um, we know he was at the temple at the age of 12 because Scripture tells us. But in terms of the rest of the world, it's not until his public ministry begins when he's uh, uh, 30, 30 years old and he starts working as the, the prophet and the teacher and the rabbi for those final three years of his life and then his death and resurrection. So it's not like today where if somebody of significance was born, People would be following him. They would be keeping up with him. Certainly the three kings, the three magi, as you said, they had to get back to their own kingdoms or whatever their livelihoods were, and they didn't live as, you know, I, I don't think they would have lived long enough to see Jesus uh, uh, in his public ministry. They may have, but, uh, you know, there's that aspect of the practicality. And then there's also the, the aspect of, of faith, that uh, he wanted people to believe in him uh, and not just based on the fact that other people, um, you know, recall his birth. So as significant as it was, his birth and, and his arrival here on earth, what he did uh, later in life was even more monumental. 
833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America. 833-288-3986. If you're outside the United States and Canada, we'd love to hear from you. That number is one 205 271 2985 and we'll even put you straight to the front of the line at 1 205 271 2985 it's EWTN's open line monday with father john tragilio This is Father John Tregilio. Want to be notified when EWTN Open Line goes live on Facebook? Follow EWTN Radio's Facebook page and click the bell icon to be notified. Tomorrow morning on the Sunrise Morning Show. Dominican Father Patrick Briscoe will talk about the O antiphons and why we should meditate on arches during this final week of Advent. Steve Ray will be along to talk about the history of the little town of Bethlehem. We'll reflect on this week's selection from the Office of Readings with Chris McGregor from DiscerningHearts.com. The Sunrise Morning Show, tomorrow at 6 a.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. This is a Messy Family Minute with Mike and Alicia Hernan. Children are a gift from God and a tremendous blessing. Does that mean that every time we were pregnant, we were always excited about having another baby? To tell you the truth, not always. Sometimes we were under financial or emotional stress, the job situation was tricky, and the thought of another child seemed overwhelming. But you know what? It always worked out. Feelings of being overwhelmed or even crying at a pregnancy test are very human, and it's okay to be human. Sometimes God puts things in our path that are difficult, but they're there for a purpose. Feelings of being overwhelmed can prompt you to get the support you need or change jobs or get your finances in order. These feelings can also drive us to our knees, so we depend on our Lord even more. When you experience that surprise pregnancy, get on the same page with your spouse. Seek out good friends who will encourage you. And remember, you can always imagine the difficulties that life will bring, but you can't imagine the grace that God will provide in that moment. To listen to our podcast, visit us at MessyFamilyMinute.org. Hi, this is Cy Kellett. Later today on Catholic Answers Live, get ready for Christmas with Steve Ray. Catholic Answers Live, 6 p.m. Eastern on EWTN Radio. Now, back to Open Line with Father John Tregilio. This is Open Line on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network. 833-288-EWTN. That is our toll-free number. Grab one of these open phone lines at 833-288-3986. Um, a big congratulations to a longtime member of the EWTN Radio family, Catholic Community Radio in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, as well as New Orleans, celebrating their 13th year with EWTN Radio. Congratulations to Dave Dawson, Jeff Blackwell, and everyone at Catholic Community Radio from your friends here at EWTN Radio. It makes me want some jambalaya. <laughs> anyway, back to the phones we go. Uh, next up is Esther. She is in the Republic of Texas, a first-time caller listening on the EWTN app. Esther, you are on with Father John Tregilio. Oh, hi. Hi, Father. I had a question. Um, this weekend we had my daughter's wedding, and when it came time to communion, this was in another town that we don't belong to that parish in San Antonio, and the priest explained that at the time of communion, they want that the archbishop was now asking that everyone come up so that there was no one felt left out. But if you were not going to receive communion to cross your arms and you were not going to get a blessing, but you were going to receive uh, Jesus spiritually. And I noticed that, uh, like my daughter, I know she hasn't been to church in years. And there's another one of our families who have left the church and are now Christian. They all went up and they received communion. And I think they were confused. Maybe it wasn't clarified. And um, I was wondering if this is something new and, and how did it get started if you knew Yes, um, <clears throat> that's an excellent question, and especially this time of year with people 
going to church on Christmas, um, uh, who have not maybe gone r the rest of the year, um, it's true that it, you must be a, a practicing Catholic who's in the state of grace to receive the, the Blessed Sacrament, to receive Holy Communion, Holy Eucharist. Um, I know this practice of having people who are not in the proper state, whether because they're in mortal sin or they they could have eaten before Mass. I mean, there's still the hour fast before communion. So if you had a donut in the car before you got in the church, you should not go to communion. And if you've missed Mass the, the week before, you should not go to communion. If you're in Valley married, you should not be going to communion. And if you're not of the Catholic faith, you should not be going to communion. But inviting people forward who are in that particular state where they cannot receive, I understand the, the rationale of people crossing their arms over their chest to indicate to the person giving communion, no, I'm not to receive the Blessed Sacrament, uh, but they can get a blessing or a prayer can be said for them. But the priest must make it very clear, and I've done this myself at weddings and funerals and at Christmas and Easter because we have so many guests coming there, to say that if you are Catholic and you're in the properly disposed, meaning you're in the state of grace, you may come forward to receive communion. And if you're not properly disposed, if you're not Catholic, and you want a blessing, then indicate by putting your arms. Now, one of the things that people don't realize is in the Eastern Catholic tradition, like the Byzantine Catholics and Melkites and Maronites, and that that's how they receive communion. They come up with their arms crossed, and then they open their mouth because they receive communion um, typically by, by intinction. Um, but normally speaking, when you're in a typical Latin Rite parish, you're not going to see uh, a lot of Eastern uh, Christians there. Um, but the priest does need to explain that a little bit further to say that, you know, if you come forward like this with your arms crossed, please stay put, keep your mouth shut, uh, keep your hands to yourself so that that reinforces to the person distributing that, no, I am not to receive the Blessed Sacrament. Um, the idea is to be a little bit more sensitive um, to the fact that there's people who don't want to stay in the pew and be outcast. However, like I said, you don't know if the reason why they're not standing up and going to communion is, one, they don't want to go. It's not an obligation that you must go. You only have to go once uh, during the Easter or, uh, Easter tide. Or that they had something to eat, or, you know, th yes, they had a mortal sin, or they're in valley marriage. So we don't know all those things, so you can't presume the reason why someone's not coming forward is a bad, bad reason. It could be something a little less severe. But uh, since it is being done more and more, I think you're right. The priest needs to be a little bit more precise on how to do it and why. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. It's a free phone call anywhere in North America, 833-288-3986. Uh, Father, you are number one in the Republic of Texas today. Rosie Ooh. is up next, a first-time caller from San Antonio, Texas, listening on Guadalupe Radio. Rosie, you are on with Father John Tregilio. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hi, Rosie. What's your question today? Yes, sir. Um I was just, um, it's, it's something that has to do with a friend of mine. Uh, we both grew up Catholic, and I've known them since middle school. And um, they they have their beliefs, you know, with their religion. They're not Catholic anymore. And um, I'm still Catholic, and um, I just feel like I can't um, share sometimes, like, you know, um, things about my religion or, you know, joys that I've had, that I've experienced, you know, with her, without her being, like, critic. Um, and I know she means well, uh, uh, you know, but I just, um, I think she's gotten better with it and understanding where I'm coming from. But I just, I still don't feel, you know, that comfortable, um, like, sharing with her without her coming back, you know, with a, Critic comment. How do you say? Like a comment. A critical you know, that, comment. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Um, so you know, I don't know how to handle it. I mean, I you know, we're 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 in good standings and everything. It's just that, like. Yeah. That's a tough situation, Father. Huh? Even with is. anybody, but especially somebody that you've been that close to for so long. Yeah, and your only options are one to avoid all discussions on religion, which 
you know, can be done, but it's not always easy. And two, you know, uh, you want to do it in in a a way that doesn't uh, offend, but at the same time, you're not diluting. You don't. You, you never, never should dilute or water down your faith because of someone else. But if they see that this really is powerful, meaningful, uh, helpful to you, then maybe she'll want to come back. But it's not going to be by words. It's going to be by deeds. So if she sees that your Catholic faith makes helps you become a better person, uh, that's going to speak volumes to her. But certainly, if whenever she asks or the occasion arises, you know, um, about certain things, you know, was the Mary have other children? Um, you know, uh, why do you call priest father? These are all things where if somebody asks, the occasion arises, yes, you know, it would be prudent for you to uh, give the, the, the right answer. But I wouldn't necessarily say that you want to go and proselytize. You want to evangelize. And evangelization occurs when someone is open to it. Um, so go in friendship. Um, you know, try to keep the conversation as congenial as possible. But at the same token, you know, as a friend, you're going to want to at least make an effort in a very delicate way. Uh, you know, it's not like you're going there to teach CCD, but the same token too, you're, that's part of who you are as a Catholic. And so it's not like I will have to you know, leave my Catholicism outside as I go into their house, but neither do you want to go over there to have the, you know, the, the religion debate, as they say. God bless you, uh, Rosie. We will keep you in our prayers for sure. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. We've still got time for your calls. Pick up the phone and give us a call at 833-288-3986. Mary is in Stamford, Connecticut, listening on Veritas Catholic Radio today. Mary, you are on with Father John Tregilio. Hi, Father John. Hi, Jack. Thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. My question is, uh, we have a priest that when he raises the host during the consecration, he's not saying, do this in remembrance of me. But when he raises the chalice with the blood of Christ, he does. Is that correct? Okay, he should be saying and only saying what's in the Roman Missal. Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. Um, that's what's stated in the text. Um, the words for the consecration of the chalice are a little bit different than the ones for for the sacred host. So um, as long as he says the exact words as they are stated in the Missal, it's valid and it's licit. If he changes anything um, other than... The absolute necessary words for validity are this is my body and this is my blood, but the other words are necessary for it to be licit and for him not to be guilty of the sin uh, of sacrilege, uh, if he's, you know, substituting words. But um, they're not going to be exactly the same. There is a, there's a little subtle uh, difference there. Does this have any ramifications for the faithful? If I would say if, if he's not saying what's exactly stated in the book, yes, he must be called on that. But, you know, maybe he's, I mean, if he's doing this more more than once, this is deliberate, this is intentional, and someone just needs to say, Father, you know, could you just uh, explain to me, you know, in a very non-threatening way, say, Father, could you please share with us or with me why you're not saying what the words are in, in the text? Because, you know, it's that famous axiom, you know, you say the black, you do the red. And if he doesn't give a good, coherent explanation, and there really isn't one, you you do what it says there. Though those words are in capital letters for a reason in the in the Roman Missal, uh, that needs to be reported to the, to the diocese if this continues to happen. He must say those words and only those words, and you can very easily find them online. Uh, you know, look at the Ordo Missae uh, in in English or whatever language. Uh, is being spoken there. 833-288-EWTN is our toll-free number. Still time for your calls at 833-288-3986. Next up is Brandon, a first-time caller in the state of California, listening today uh, on Sirius XM Channel 130. Brandon, you're on with Father John. Hello, Father John. Thank you very much for uh, taking my call here. It is my first time calling in. 
Um, I just had a, a quick question on the um, order of Mass with the traditions. Of, now, I'm, I'm a newly baptized Catholic as of last year, uh, baptized over actually in Texas, and they have a Catholic church over there. Uh, recently moved to California uh, this July, and I have noticed that um, the California churches do do a little bit differently when it comes to the Mass that I'm, I'm familiar with. Um, I think the Catholic Mass is beautiful. Um, however, I, I feel that they're losing some of their traditions when it comes to the ringing of the bells uh, when you're receipt when they're doing the sacraments or the incense. Um, and I was just curious uh, in Texas they do an awful lot of that, but California here that's almost absent and not even existent anymore. And so my question was: Is certain is, is certain places starting to lose? really the, the tradition of what it is to come together at Mass for the sight, smell, sounds, and to use our senses um, at, at Mass. I, I think that I'm, I'm so glad you, you called and, and brought that to, to our attention because you are right that, you know, the, the Catholic worship involves the whole person, body and soul, and our body has five senses. And one of the beautiful things of, of, of Catholicism is that we do our best to uh, appeal to all the senses. So we have the the incense for the for the sense of smell. We have, uh, not we have the bells, the sanctus bells. We also have uh, the music, the chant, uh, for the sense of hearing. And for the eyes, we have the stained glass windows and you know the vestments and and, and everything like that. So uh, th that's there for a purpose, but it doesn't make it obviously doesn't make it invalid or illicit. You know, there's op these are options whether you ring the sanctus bells, whether you use incense, but it's also very good and helpful to employ these things because we are not, uh, you know, trying to say that the body gets in the way. This isn't just purely spiritual; is body and soul, and uh, unlike some other uh, denominations and, and traditions where they keep it as simple as possible, in Catholicism we like to, you know really do things up right and some people might say well it's a little bit too much well uh i find that that's not the case that uh you know it's not just for the middle ages when people couldn't read or write you needed stained glass windows to teach them it's also the fact that they're very edifying you know the the pictures the images uh just the light itself uh it helps us to transcend from this world into the next so while it's not uh, something that makes it invalid or illicit I would say I think you still could find, you might have to look around a little bit more, but uh, I have friends out in California, in San Diego, and Los Angeles, and San Francisco, where there's at least one parish in that area where, you know, they're doing things a little bit more traditional. Uh, but again, that doesn't mean it's um, any more valid than the places where they don't. But uh, I've been to parishes where, uh, like I think it was one in Denver where, uh, the backdrop, the wall of the sanctuary was clear glass so you could see the Rocky Mountains. That's nice, but I still prefer, you know, some stained glass. Maybe not uh, the, from, the, from the ceiling to the floor as you would have in other places, but something yet you could incorporate a little bit of both perhaps. Like when Father Briganti was um, putting stained glass windows in his church, uh, they incorporated in the background a little bit more clear glass, translucent, and then the actual stained glass in, in the center of it, um, as opposed to in Chartres, France, where it's completely all stained glass. So, yes, I think you you touched on a valid point, and um, certainly that should be encouraging to my brother priests who are pastors and churches that don't look as traditional to, you know, spruce it up a little bit more. And it's not just for the sake of tradition, it's the fact that you want to impart on the people the fact that we are very incarnational. We employ all the senses, the body, and the soul. Um, how many different states send you seminarians? We are now, I think, at 23 or 24. So I'm sure that the specific liturgical practices run the gamut, huh? Oh, uh, to a degree, yes. I mean, the fact that they send here... You know, we 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 don't get uh, from dioceses that are way, way, way out in left field. <laughs> right, right. But I'm sure of it. It's something that you address with the the men that are in formation. That uh, you know, I, what I always tell people is that you know, if if 
if you're within the prescribed norms, the most important thing is to not cast aspersions on people that are doing something that's not exactly the way you're doing it, huh? That's right. And, you know, we don't, we don't want to impute motives. We don't want to presume the worst, give people the benefit of the doubt. But the same token, when people in a very charitable way say to their pastors, like when people would say to me, Father, I don't like the incense. Well, I would be sensitive to it that I wasn't going to, you know, load up uh, five extra scoops and uh, do it 12 times during the liturgy if, um, you know, if I could, you know, change the amount or uh, one mass, have a, have a solemn high mass and then uh, a, a lesser one. So you could accommodate without, you know, like I said, caving in. You know, and it's interesting because from our end, we are always giving advice to folks that call the programs about the most charitable and proper way to approach priests about such things. Do you cover this with the men in formation about how to receive these sorts of uh, messages from <laughs> yes. parishioners? <clears throat> yes, I'm glad you asked that because that's one of my seminars is priests as a public person. And one of the things I insist and I reiterate to them again and again, you have to be docile to what your people are expressing to you because canon law and moral law make it clear that people have the right to express to their spiritual leaders, their pastors, their bishops, what they need, what they feel they need, and we need to address that. Now, if there's something that we can't do, we obviously need to still speak to them about that. You know, sometimes people want music that's inappropriate. Uh, you know, a lot of, some people say, oh, let's have a, a Christian rock group and have them play at Mass. No, I said, that's not, but you could have a Christian rock concert in the social hall, you know, and the kids would still be able to go to that. Um, so, yes, you have to be, listen to what people have to say. It's like when I was doing the Mass ad Orientum once a month in my parish. I explained to them why I could do it, why I was doing it, and I gave them time to ask me questions before I just plopped it on their lap, like happened for some parishes right after the council. They No explanations were given, and people just showed up at Mass one day. The week before was Latin, now it's English. The priest was uh, facing the tabernacle, now he's facing them, with no explanation. And people are not stupid, they're intelligent. And if you respect them for that, they may not agree with you, but they'll, they'll respect the fact that you respect them. Be sure to join us for the Chaplet of Divine Mercy Monday through Friday mornings at 5 a.m. Eastern Time right here on EWTN Radio. Still time for your calls. We could squeeze a couple in at 833-288-EWTN. Give us a call at 833-288-3986. Frederick would like to know, how does the Catholic Church go about deciding which books are inspired by God? Well, um, one of the criteria that they used was uh, certainly the fact that these books were accepted and used in the, in the early ancient church. Uh, there were a couple of councils that met. Uh, it's the magisterial teaching of, of authority of the church that made those decisions, that these books and only these books. And it was really um, you know, the Council of Trent that made it once and for all, because uh, before that, um, Martin Luther was questioning uh, the validity of the Deuterocanonical books, those seven extra books uh, in the um, Old Testament that were not originally written in Hebrew, they were written in Greek, but they were considered inspired texts at the time, and they go back to 250 B.C., they were considered inspired texts at the time of Jesus and the Apostles, and they were considered inspired all the way up until the 1500s. So, um, it, you know, the, the problem is there's not a list in the Bible itself. Even the word Bible isn't in the Bible. But the teaching authority of the church is the one. So there are a couple of councils um, back in the ancient church, I think as far back as the hundreds and two hundreds, that give us a list of what's considered text. And then we have the first complete Bible, the, the Vulgate, that was done by St. Jerome, where he translated the, the Hebrew and the Greek into Latin. And Pope Damasus... Uh, is the one who uh, not only requested he do that, but also insisted that all these books be contained in there. So we have there, um, you know, the, the 46 books of the Old Testament and the 27 in the New. And this continued all the way, even when you look at the Gutenberg Bible, it's, it's complete. It's only after the Reformation that you have seven books taken out as opposed to the accusation that we inserted them in. We kept what was there. 
Uh, Randall would like to know, he says, when Moses and Elijah appear, when Jesus is transfigured on the mountain, I've been told that this is necromancy. How can I respond to this accusation? (laughs) Well, necromancy is when you conjure up the dead, like some people do at seances or Ouija boards and that. Elijah and Moses, who are dead, they're not summoned. You know, Jesus didn't have a little, you know, Ouija board with him and, and do this. They appeared because, you know, they were good, holy people. They were not in heaven yet because Jesus had not yet redeemed the whole human race on Good Friday. But their souls were still immortal and they still existed. And it was by the power of God. Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. So he is not committing necromancy because he has the power to uh, bring the dead, uh, so to speak, to, to life. Their bodies are dead, but their soul is still much, very much alive. So you could never uh, consider that that was any form of necromancy, com- com- commuting with the dead or um, summoning the dead as is done in magic and superstition, the black arts, uh, anything that's um, you know, the part of the occult. This is completely opposite. This is God himself you know, doing what God can do. And uh, Stephen writes in, toward the end of the book of Daniel, it suddenly begins portraying him as a younger man. Why is this? And also they mention wars with the prince of Persia. Are these actual wars? Okay, well, you have to remember, too, that in the book of Daniel especially, we have some um, we call apocalyptic uh, literature. Uh, apocalyptic, you know, refers to a, a special genre of uh, biblical uh, literary forms that is very symbolic and has a lots of layers of meaning on it just as we have especially you know in the in the book of revelation which is also called the apocalypse so you're going to have apocalyptic obviously in the in the apocalypse and we see it in daniel that we have references to what is to come we have certainly references to jesus and the messiah and also references to even beyond that so Trying to find a literal interpretation is difficult in literature that's not designed that way. So we don't want to, you know, put uh, too much emphasis on particulars when you're looking at the, that type of literature. Thanks so much, Jim. We uh, or actually Stephen, we appreciate that uh, phone call. Jim in great state of New Jersey and Rosemary in Waukegan, Illinois. If you will hang on the line, we are getting ready after we're done here in just about a minute or so uh, of recording a mailbag edition of EWTN's Open Line Monday for next Monday, which will be the day after Christmas, and we're closed. So we're going to uh, record a very special mailbag edition, uh, and we would be happy to take your phone call at that time. So if you'll just sit tight for a couple of minutes, we will make that Happen. Father Tregilio, would you be so kind as to leave us with a Christmas blessing? Absolutely. Benedica vos omnipotens Deus, Pater et Filius et Spiritus Sanctus. Amen. Amen. On behalf of our host, Father John Tregilio, our producer, Charles Beery, our call screener, Matt Kubensky, and our social media maven, Mr. Jeff Burson. I'm Jack Williams, wishing that you have a tremendous rest of your Advent season. It's a blessing this year. We get a full fourth week of Advent. What a joy. Some days we get one day. This year we get a whole week of this fourth week of Advent. And we hope that you have a blessed Christmas and a wonderful new year as well. From all of us here at EWTN Radio, back at it tomorrow with Father Wade. Until then, God bless. It's really awe-inspiring to know that Take-Two with Jerry